Subcommittee will come to order, and good afternoon to everybody. Rwanda is an important African ally. We know it. They have been for a very long time. This East African nation has been a valuable contributor to peacekeeping in Africa and is the sixth largest troop and police contributor to UN missions. However, reports have increased about the status of human rights and rule of law inside Rwanda and its efforts to silence critics living abroad. This hearing will continue to examine the future of democracy and the rule of law in Rwanda in light of persistent criticism of its government's behavior at home and on the international stage. Rwanda is a constitutional republic dominated by a very strong presidency. In 2015, the country held a constitutional referendum in which an estimated 98% of registered voters participated. Approximately 98% of those who voted endorsed a set of amendments that included provisions that would allow the president to run for up to three additional terms in office, meaning Paul Kagame could be president for more than 20 more years. His election to a third term in August of 2017 was achieved with 99% of the vote. A popular politician in the United States or most other countries would be unlikely in most circumstances to win nearly 100% of the vote in a free, fair, and competitive election. Consequently, it is difficult to believe that even someone as widely admired as President Kagame could have been that popular. Such suspicion is stoked by reports of vote irregularities and actions by the Rwandan government to restrain opposition activism and enact stringent controls on opposition activism, including legal restrictions on civil liberties and str stringent controls on the free flow of information. An example of why there is skepticism about the nature of free elections in Rwanda is the case of businesswoman Diane Rigara, who ran as a critic of Kagame. Days after she launched her campaign, nude photos allegedly of her were leaked onto the internet in an attempt to discredit her. She said she would not be intimidated and continued her campaign. On July 7th, the National Electoral Commission disqualified her and two other candidates on technical grounds, alleging they had not collected enough valid signatures. Amnesty International said that the election would be held in a, uh, would be held in a climate of fear and repression, and the Commission's decision was criticized by the U.S. State Department as well as the European Union. Following the election, Regara launched an activist group called the People's Salvation Movement to challenge the regime on its human rights record, saying that the country's parliament is little more than a rubber stamp. Within days, her home was raided and she was arrested for forgery and tax evasion. Within days, uh, although she was released, Regara was rearrested for forgery and offenses against state security. Her mother and her sisters were also subsequently arrested for tax evasion. This is not the only case of harsh punishment of those who criticize the Kagame government. David Himbara, one of our witnesses today, was a close advisor to President Kagame and has an inside view of how this government deals with those seen as failing the government or those who disagree with it. He testified on the inner workings of the Kagame government on, at our May 20th, 2015 hearing on Rwanda. Another witness at that May 2015 hearing was Robert Higuero, who told a Chile account of being solicited to commit murders of two formerly high-ranking military and security officials. That account was backed by authenticated recordings of Rwanda's security chief offering large sums of money for the murders. In fact, after Mr. Higuero testified about his offer, he had to move from Belgium to the United States because his life was in danger. Both of our Rwandan witnesses have new information today that will be important for our government's policy towards Rwanda. During a staff delegation to South Africa last year, two of my staff spoke with officials of the government of South Africa, which was highly offended that the Rwandan government would be involved in the murder of a dissident on New Year's Eve 2013. My staff also spoke with Rwandan refugees in South Africa who reported being afraid of officials at the Rwandan embassy in South Africa who said they had threatened them for seeking asylum. Again, Rwanda is not your typical dictatorship in which all people suffer under an unpopular leader uh, who does not provide for social services or security. 
Many Rwandans apparently generally feel the government is acting in their interest, especially in providing for inter-ethnic harmony. It is this anomaly that we seek to better understand in part through this hearing today. My office has compiled a report on our government's human rights issues uh, with Rwanda, and we are due to discuss these matters with them further. We would be a poor ally if we did not caution the Rwandan government about human rights abuses and the international community, uh, uh, which the, the international community cites. Um, and um, so I, I would just conclude, um, you know, in reading over all the testimony, I just thought there were a number of important uh, points made by all of our witnesses, but Amnesty, I think, really brought home the fact that numerous journalists have been imprisoned. Uh, the Rwandan government continues to suppress the independence of freedom of the media. Uh, this is from their testimony uh, for today. Uh, they also point out that the international community, uh, including the Clinton, the Bush, and the Obama administrations, have been at best half-hearted in confronting President Kagame and pressing the Rwandan government to reform its policy regarding human rights and political space. I'd like to now yield to my friend and colleague, uh, Karen Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as always, thank you for your leadership in holding today's uh, hearing on developments in Rwanda, especially regarding examining democratic practices. While Rwanda is geographically a small nation, its condition and role in the stability of the Great Lakes region is, cru is critical. I also want to thank our distinguished witnesses today, including the Honorable Donald Yamamoto. We are happy you're here representing the State Department. Um, I do hope you won't be acting forever. Uh, several members of the Rwanda diaspora and the international human rights community. I look forward to hearing your various perspectives on both the successes and challenges uh, uh, of democracy in Rwanda. Uh, Chairman Smith, I believe, uh, very clearly laid out uh, many of the challenges. Uh, and while I know that there are many challenges across Africa, and while it's very important to address the challenges and concerns, it's also important to talk about where there have been some positive developments, especially given Rwanda's history. Uh, Rwanda experienced a very dark time in 94 when over 800,000 people lost their lives. The aftermath of the 94 genocide left the physical infrastructure and political institutions destroyed. The country lost skilled human resources and was left with a dilapidated economy. Since that time, Rwanda has exhibited a rare degree of internal stability and economic growth in a sub-region marked by armed conflict and violent transfers of power. Over the last 23 years, Rwanda has sought to change the course of the nation and embarked on an act active effort to improve citizens' health, boost agricultural output, promote investment, and increase women's participation. Uh, I do have to note that Rwanda is a world leader in women's representation with over 64% of the parliament being women, and that's compared to the United States, which is 18%. Uh, additionally, Ra Rwanda has experienced an average of 7.6% growth per year over the last decade, and this is in part due to the pro-investor policies, and Rwanda scores very well on the World's Bank Doing Business Report, ranking 56 out of 190 economies assessed in 2017 and number two in Sub-Saharan Africa. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, between 1990 and 2016, life expectancy increased from 48 to 66 years. The mortality rate of children fell fell uh, from 152 to 42 deaths per 1,000 live births, and the maternal mortality rate decreased from 1,300 deaths to 290 per 100,000. Literacy levels in the country for both men and women are at nearly 70%. Uh, Rwanda also plays a major role in peacekeeping across Africa, and Rwandan troops participate in multiple UN and African Union missions. Rwanda's peacekeepers are reportedly particularly valued because of their training and discipline. So the country has come a long way. In spite of the progress, though, there has been a great deal of concern over Rwanda's history of unilateral intervention in the sub-region and about restrictive political environment. Rwanda has the potential to be a strong regional leader, but to do this, like all countries, it must continue to address its internal challenges. For the country's own success, it should create a space for freedom of expression, ensure the free flow of information in the country, and seek AU or UN authorization or mediation when dealing with neighboring countries. I yield back my time, Mr. Chair. 
like to now welcome back uh, to the subcommittee a very distinguished Donald uh, Y. Yamamoto, uh, who is serving as the Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. He has served as the uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs from 03 to 06, was responsible for coordinating U.S. policy towards more than 20 countries in East and Central Africa. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia from 2006 to 2009, and U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Djibouti from 2000 to 2003. And um, uh, he has testified many, many times before this committee, and he's more than welcome. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, please proceed as you would like. Sure, without objection, so ordered. Sorry about that, thanks. Uh, and the constitutional amendments allow President Kagame, who has been in office since 2000, to run for a third term. We continue to publicly and privately emphasize our conviction that constitutional transition of power are essential for strong democracies everywhere, and the efforts by incumbents to change rules to stay in power when we can, will weaken democratic institutions and undermine long-term stability. The August 4th presidential elections illustrate that democracy in Rwanda remains far from perfect. As you know, the president was reelected in an official tally of nearly 99% of the vote. In the August 5th statement, we said we were disturbed by the voting irregularities we had observed 
and reiterated our longstanding concerns over the integrity of the voting, uh, vote counting process. Three aspiring candidates were disqualified before the election, and we ex expressed concern that the lack of transparency in the process. We noted in our statement, we hope that these concerns will be addressed before the 2018 parliamentary elections. Compared to the previous presidential elections in 2010, however, we noted some progress. The first election in which the Democratic Green Party, the main registered opposition party in Rwanda, was allowed to participate. The Rwanda media was reported on the harassment of some opposition candidates and government officials took action to address those complaints in the areas of by arresting local officials. Since the election, Rwandan officials have targeted several political opposition figures for questioning or arrest. And we are concerned by and are following closely the case of Diane uh, Ugera, one of the three disqualified presidential aspirants. Police raided her home on August 29th, arrested Mrs. Ruggera and two of her family members on September 23. We understand that the Rwandan authorities have until September 28th to press charges. In addition, we are following the arrest of at least 10 officials and members of an unregistered opposition party earlier this month. The cases suggest that tight restrictions remain a political on political competition and critics of the ruling party. Other serious human rights violations have, have been cited in our reports to Congress and include arbitrary and unlawful killings, the security forces disregard for the rule of law, restrictions on civil society organizations, government interference with the press. Over the years, Rwandas have reported uh, to us the disappearance of suspected death of family members at the hands of the Rwanda security services. NGOs critical of the government are routinely denied registration to operate in the country. Government officials have also questioned, threatened, and arrested journalists who express critical views on sensitive topics. The government has used laws criminalizing genocide ideology and divisionism, along with national security provisions to suppress dissent, prosecute journalists, and pressure human rights groups to refrain from investigating and reporting on their findings. The administration continues to take action to address these human rights situations in Rwanda. In 2017, our ambassador in Kigali initiated quarterly high-level dialogues with the government on civil society and media freedom. USAID supports a number of targeted activities to promote the rule of law. In some areas where we continue to work include strengthening local NGO capacity to engage in policymaking improvements and to laws governing NGOs increasing the capacity and skills of the media to provide independent and partial information and skill training for judges. Rwanda benefits from the, uh, the AGOA, and we have raised concerns to the Ro Rwandan government regarding harassment of political opposition leaders and NGOs, as well as restrictions on media freedom within the context of the AGOA eligibility. We, we are responding to Rwanda's request for help to combat trafficking in persons, including improving prosecution skills and uh, closing gaps. And over the last decade, we have worked closely with the Rwandan government, civil society, private sector to combat child labor. And thanks to our partnership, approximately 5,000 children were removed from child labor in Rwanda's tea growing districts between 2015 and 2017 alone. And I'd like to note the new good news with respect to human rights and governance in Rwanda. The government of Rwanda holds public officials accountable for corrupt practices, including through prosecution. Rwanda has also prioritized the fight against gender-based violence and generally respects the rights of LGBTI persons. Women leaders are promoted as evidenced by the fact, as the Congresswoman stated, of 63% of the parliament members and 40% of the cabinet officials are female. Human rights are part and parcel of our ongoing dialogue at all levels of the Rwandan government, and our consistent message remains that allowing the opposition figures, journalists, and civil society to contribute to Rwanda's future is crucial to building a knowledge-based economy and government seeks to foster. This includes ensuring freedom of expression, press freedom, ability of citizens to criticize the government, and ruling party without fear of threats or violence uh, or intimidation. And with that, I defer to you, Mr. Congressman, for <coughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Let me begin by asking, um, did you, did the department um, consider the elections to be free, fair, and transparent? Uh, you note that there is some progress. You note that the Democratic Green Party, which got less than 1%, I presume, far less than that in the election, 
uh, rather than the other parties that might have had a more robust uh, showing on Election Day as some progress. And you also point out that the Rwandan media, you don't say whether or not we independently verified it, uh, reported that on the harassment of some opposition candidates and that government officials took action to address those complaints. Uh, is that all true, or is it just something that was in the local papers? Because you did point out in the next sentence, next paragraph, since the election, Rwandan authorities have targeted, what a word, targeted, several political opposition figures for questioning or arrest. Uh, you know, so those who were unhappy with the results couldn't participate the way they ought to have been able to do. Uh, now f get further retaliation after the election. I don't see where that's some progress. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So our relationship with Rwanda is is one of a mixed relationship on the issue of uh, democratic uh, concerns and human rights issues. But if we look at one issue areas, is if the elections were completely free, open, fair, transparent in the U.S. context, would President Kagame win that election? And the answer is he has over. Oh, I don't think that's uh, a good question to ask. Sure. I think it should be whether or not the process was free, fair, and transparent. Well, and then let the people decide. Right. So after the presidential elections, we had made a statement saying that we noted irregularities in the process. And that is an issue that we had raised with the government and also uh, looked at uh, ways in which we could work with the government of uh, Rwanda to improve the process uh, in the elections. Uh, let me also state that w uh, one positive uh, point for the electoral process since 2010 is that we did have uh, the registration of the Democratic Green Party and uh, also the first uh, uh, debate, political debate for the presidency. But his numbers, obviously, uh, President Kagame's have gone up to the point where they're almost 100 percent. So any sense that things are trending towards more openness, transparency, would you be able to say here and now that it was a free and fair election? Yes or no? And the answer is more complex. Is, and, the, and the issue is that in our statement that we had stated that we had concerns with the process of the elections because of the irregularities that we noted. And of course like that's what, what were the irregularities? The irregularities uh, concerned on, on the process and procedures. And the issue of having 98.9% .9 of the vote, that in itself uh, denotes or relates to information of irregularities. And candidates were excluded from participation? Arbitrarily and capricious? Yes? Yes. yes. Uh, wh why can't we just simply say it wasn't free, wasn't fair, wasn't transparent? That the, uh, the because the ov on the overall issues that we s noted the irregularities and we noticed good points and bad points. And so there's a process. And what we hope to achieve in our overall relationship with Rwanda is that this is a reliable partnership and that we want to move it in a forward uh, posture. And that's what I we're agree on behalf of the people. We do everything we can health wise and everything to be of assistance, even with dictatorships. But I don't think we should look askance and not call it for what it is. If it's a sham election, we ought to call it a sham election. And, and, and we Did agree with you. Say that? Yeah, we agree with you 100 percent. That it's a sham election or that, no, that we look at elections and judge it by the standards of a free, fair, transparent election process. And when there are regularities, we will call it out. And as we but did But at August. the end of the day, a judgment has to be made based on the evidence. Yeah. But you can't make the decision that it was a, or will not make the decision we that it was not free, not fair, and not transparent. It was not a transparent process. I mean, it was not a, uh, there were irregularities in the process of the election. At the end of the day, was it free and fair? No? Yes? <laughs> It's a, again, Mr. Chairman, it becomes a very complex uh, process. See, I'm not sure uh, why we can't make a judgment. Um, it's disappointing. Human Rights Watch has documented, this is from, uh, without objection, I'd like their August 18th, um, Rwanda politically closed elections, a chrono chronology of violations. Part of what their one just pull quote, Human Rights Watch has documented that poor people, critics of government decisions regarding land disputes and suspected petty criminals have been arbitrarily arrested, held in illegal detention centers, and in some cases executed, forcibly disappeared, tortured, and mistreated. These taxes ensure the citizens are afraid to speak out against the government. And they go through one, what you would call irregularity after another. Um, again, I don't know why the judgment can't be made 
that this was not a free and fair election. Uh, Amnesty points out in their comments um, uh, quite extensively that the Rwandan government continues to suppress the independence and freedom of the media. Numerous journalists have been imprisoned, harassed, and even killed, while many more have been have fled into exile over the years. Uh, then they give specific examples uh, on that. Uh, these actions mirror previous media crackdowns. Is there a media crackdown? Was there before the election, during the election, and after the election? Let me go to your first question, yes. Mr. Chairman. So, so first is, is on the voting and the vote count irregularities that we observed on the August 4th presidential elections, we are not able, we are unable to assess this election as free and fair. So that's our original statement. We have communicated our ob observations and assessment to the Rwandan government. On the issues of, uh, of human rights abuse during the pr procedures and process of the elections before, during, and after, we are concerned with any reports of human rights. We have started through our ambassador, through our embassy, a very um, uh, engaging with the government at all levels on these issues, and we express our concerns. But again, if I could, with all due respect, Mr. Ambassador, we've had human rights dialogues in places like Vietnam for years. They have been uh, a cul-de-sac where, where people meet, nothing happens. Uh, it is a venting of, of disagreements, and then they're used as an excuse for not calling out Vietnam for its egregious abuses, whether it be as a CPC country or as a violator with regards to trafficking. Uh, the dialogues, I think, are important, but they can't be a substitute for calling it the way it is in a forum like this, a forum like this or, or anywhere else, particularly after the election. I mean, 99 percent, one party is given the green light, which was destined to lose massively. Um, I don't see that as progress. I really don't, when so many others were disqualified. Uh, so I, I would take issue with some progress. I think, if anything, it is regression given his even better uh, outcome that he had in the polls, uh, you know, uh, and, and all the things that we have from Amnesty and, and, um, and Human Rights Watch about uh, just how brutal this was. Matter of fact, Amnesty said uh, in their testimony during the 23 years that the Rwandan Patriotic Front has ruled the country, there has been an unwavering, often brutal campaign against government critics and human rights defenders. This campaign has included attacks on political opposition members, including arrest, detention, disappearance and killings, restrictions on the media, and activities of civil society, and the creation of a climate of fear. And now, as you have testified, even after the election, since the election, Rwandan authorities have targeted several political opposition figures for questioning or arrest. I mean, he's not even satisfied that he got his outcome. Now he has to go after them and crush them now. You know, as I said, Mr. Chairman, that the relationship is complex, but it's also a record of mix. And, and I know that w where, where your position is, and we respect it, and to emphasize that we as the government is, are committed to looking at the concerns that you have raised today, and that we have raised them as well directly with the government. And we continue to raise them and to work with them to improve those areas where we believe that we can make a difference. And in areas that... Uh, in some areas, the Rwandan government has made dramatic increases, uh, uh, from child labor issues uh, to allowing opposition parties uh, to debates uh, to accepting a, uh, recommendations from the peer group on the under the UN operations, uh, and to look at. So we note that there's progress, but there are obviously areas that we still need to work on, and we are doing that. Let me ask you uh, one final question. Uh, Major Robert Higuero obviously testified before. Uh, he is here today. And he was disbelieved at first by the department, and I knew you have to do your due diligence, and I deeply respect that. Uh, my understanding is that you came to the conclusion that he had a credible case uh, when he came forward and said that he was offered money, uh, $1 million, to assassinate a general and a colonel who had fled Rwanda uh, to South Africa. Uh, in his testimony today, he thanks America profusely. He was, had a death threat of, against him uh, when he was living in Belgium and now has come to the United States. Um, uh, he points out in his testimony that members of the opposition parties and the media continue to disappear, uh, present tense, not past tense, present tense. Um, how do you assess his revelations 
and this idea that members of the opposition parties and media continue to disappear? So, you know, our position remains very clear. It's, it's, um, uh, we have received the book from uh, Mr. Guerra, and uh, I will diligently read that in, in details. But again, we remain concerned by the history of Rwanda's treatment of opposition people. And the issues that were raised by Mr. Guerra and others, those are issues and concerns that we will pursue and follow and follow up on. And again, on the other side, for the Rwandan side, is we continue to help Rwanda build strong democratic institutions. And those that's really the fundamentally the bottom line is, is to build those institutions which can um, address the, those concerns that we have raised and continue to raise. And those are the issues that we share with you, Mr. Chairman. But again, those institutions, if, if you're talking about electoral process that is egregiously flawed, uh, where's the success in building that institution? It just facilitates a 99% vote. But we have faith and confidence that through these, through our efforts, that we will uh, be able to work with this government and also others, because we do see positive uh, developments. And and through, I think you see a change of attitude on the part of President Kagame. I think that in certain areas we have seen improvement, and other areas we. See I mean, he'll be there until 2034, right? Uh, uh, under the uh, changes in constitution, if he gets elected two more times, sure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ambassador, what role, uh, if any, should the U.S. play in supporting Rwanda's stability and efforts to improve the quality of lives of Rwandan citizens? And what role should Congress play? I think Congress, well, first of all, is, is we ex extend our deep appreciation to you, Madam uh, Congresswoman, and to you, S Mr. Chairman, for all the efforts and uh, issues you've raised to highlight the concerns that you have on Africa, but also on, on a wide range of uh, issues. So the stability of not just Rwanda, but of the, of the region and the states is critical, not only to the stability for and security of that area, but also con stability and concern for the entire continent. And also it goes into our national strategic interest. So let me say, to your question is, what is it that we would like to achieve? We like to see a stable, democratic uh, um, country or which respects the rights of the citizens, respects the, the rights and freedoms of a free press, and that it helps um, with the educational opportunities and opportunities in general of, of its people. So yeah. what are we doing in that regard, especially in regard to democracy and governance? To that end, I mean, we have several, you know, from our programs in AID. I think <laughs> for our, de our development assistance and assistance overall, it's about $159 million a year. Uh, on the one hand, uh, on security aside, the uh, Ethiopians have, I mean, the Rwandans have remained extremely um, supportive and a very good partner in uh, peacekeeping operations and troops. On the side of uh, health care, you cited, M Madam Congresswoman, of the tremendous changes that they have made through health care, through HIV AIDS progress, yes. and also on, on women uh, playing a constructive role in society, and also girls' education and women entrepreneur. Those are areas that are, are positive and really stand as a model for other countries as well. So in terms of our democracy and governance? And our democracy and governance is to create strong institutions. And again, and we have specific programs. You know, I worry about this specific area because I know in the proposed cuts, if I'm not mistaken, this takes a major hit. And, and that does. The Democrat, Rwanda's uh, institutions, democratic institutions, are still developing. We believe that, and we need to focus more on creating those strong institutions which can um, uh, carry not between this president unto the next president uh, and also t for successive uh, leaderships. That's what we want to achieve and I think those are the objectives and goals uh, that we're committed to along with our NGO partners uh, and also uh, our discussions with the government of Rwanda. So to what extent is Rwanda's continued development progress contingent on continued donor aid, or how much is independent? 
in other words, to tie assistance to benchmarks mm -hmm. for development. And so <coughs> so on healthcare, you can't set be the benchmark mm -hmm. is is progress, and those progress are clear and evident right. from uh, livelihood ex and length of uh, of uh, life expectancy and uh, healthcare and HIV AIDS. When you talk about development and hu and human rights and democratic values, we have laws in place from the AGO our AGOA trading investments. There's a mm -hmm. aspect on democracy and human rights. As you know, we have written letters of uh, of of warning to the government on human rights issues. On the other issue is we have the CSPA law, uh, and then the other law that uh, uh, that the Congress uh, has passed on the 2017 uh, Appropriations uh, Act. So those are areas that we look at and say that, that these are areas that we can hold the government of Rwanda accountable. So for instance, we had suspended FMF, foreign military financing. We had suspended IMET, military education. And really, th this what is What about direct military assistance? And direct military. We had not- We suspended that? We suspended and education and we suspended- we, we, The FMF, right. Uh, but in this past year, we have not uh, renewed FMF, but we have renewed, uh, we have continued with IMET. Because really in that- What did you say IMET was again? Uh, it's I uh, International Military Education Training Program. Uh -huh. So the IMET program really is in many ways our, is in our national interest as well. Because yeah. by taking Rwandan troops and officers to the United States yeah. to give them an education on human rights, that, that makes them a better officer. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Bass. Um, just one final question. Uh, the uh, State Department has long declined to accept the various UN reports of Rwandan involvement in smuggling of resources from the uh, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, or support militia inside the country. What is the view of the department today on that? There's two any reports uh, on that? So we, so we continue monitoring um, the uh, conflict minerals in, uh, in the Congo, which countries and uh, operations are, are developing uh, from foreign countries uh, to regional states, et cetera. Um, and Rwanda has been, um, uh, in, in that area, been very supportive, um, passing laws uh, to monitor uh, the conflict minerals. Uh, and we have been working with the Rwandan government uh, to reinforce those uh, laws, uh, also to criminalize uh, any individuals who have engaged in illegal or illicit trading. And uh, again, getting back Briefly to Robert um, Hagara, <coughs> does the department believe him to be credible? I respect Mr. Hagara very much. I think uh, the position he held as an advisor to uh, President Kagame uh, and the words that he presents th uh, as testimony in the next uh, witness, I, I stand right to listen to what he's going to present. Uh, and the concerns of human rights, et cetera, we will continue to look into those now this issues. Is major Robert Higuero, who again was offered a million dollars to kill. So you believe he's credible? I respect him as an individual who has had a senior position in the government and his issues of human rights abuse or other concerns is an issue that we will look into and we will work with him. Because David Himbara was very high up at the government but it's, it's the major who was offered this incentive to, to murder people. So, the, so you believe they're both credible? So let me, st we'll stand and listen to his testimony today and we'll have uh, other further conversations later with him. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Get the uh, intros. And, th and thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Congresswoman. Thank um, you. Not only for having this uh, hearing, but also for your concern. And we remain committed to working with you um, because I think we share a very commonality in what we want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Ambassador. I'd like to now invite to the witness uh, table, first begin with David Himbara, uh, who is coordinator for, it, for Canada at Democracy in Rwanda Now. As a former close aide to President Paul Kagame, 
Mr. Himbara held a leading role focused on socioeconomic development in Rwanda. Tasked with improving national competitiveness, he spearheaded efforts that ultimately improved Rwanda's ranking in the World Bank's annual Doing Business Report. He's the author of his latest book is Kagame's Killing Fields. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Robert Higuero, who was coordinator for the United States uh, at Democracy in Rwanda Now. Prior to moving to the United States, he served as a major in the Rwandan Defense Force. He was part of the force that took control of Kigali in 1994 that toppled the then Hutu government and bringing, helped bring an end to the genocide in that country, in Rwanda. After his decommission, he was tasked by the Rwanda government with assassinating officials and dissidents that fell out of favor with the Kagame regime instead of following those orders. Major Higuero uh, went to the press and unveiled uh, the plot at great risk to himself. Uh, it led to his being insecure in Belgium and the need for him to move to the United States for his own personal security. We'll then hear from uh, Mr. Mike Jobbins, is that Jobbins? Uh, who serves as the Africa Programs Manager for Search for Common Ground. He previously worked uh, in Search for Common Ground field programs in the DRC and Burundi, where he, he support the, supported the startup and management projects on SGBV prevention, refugee reintegration, security ref sector reform, and post-war governance. Mr. Jobbins has led field missions in humanitarian and emergency settings uh, in North Katanga, North Kivu, Ecuador provinces of the DRC. He also testified previously uh, before this subcommittee. And then we'll hear from Arote Akwe, who serves in the Government Relations Office for Amnesty International. Uh, Mr. Uh, Adote is a political analyst and experienced advocate and campaigner, U.S. foreign and security policy advisor, as well as an advocate for rights-based approach to ending poverty with field experience in Africa as well as in Asia. He is also a regular spokesman for Amnesty International USA for print, radio, and television uh, in the United States, Europe, and Africa. And he, too, uh, is welcomed back uh, to our committee. Uh, Mr. David Himbar, if you would begin. Uh, uh, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Ken Bass, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, giving, me, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, about uh, democracy and human rights uh, in Rwanda. I want to talk about uh, uh, three things. First, I want to give the, the context of the recent elections. Then number two, I want to talk about the elections themselves. And then number three, I wish to talk about um, elections. Uh, the context of the elections in Rwanda was the, uh, the constitutional amendment made in 2015. The constitutional amendment uh, did uh, two things. One, uh, it removed, uh, uh, basically it removed a very, very important part of the previous constitution, which said that, I quote, under no circumstances should President of Rwanda serve more than two seven-year terms. Why was this uh, in, the, in, the in the original constitution? It was in the original constitution because historically, since independence, each leader in Rwanda has come through violence and then was removed by violence. And each of those presidents, and the, the main ones have been three, in their terms, each one managed to win elections 
by 98%. So this is not uh, an Kagame issue. It's all of them. Uh, and of course, as I said, they became power unto themselves. And none of them, we have not had any peaceful transfer of power in Rwanda. So that's, that was the importance of that clause that under no circumstances. So this is what was removed by the amendment. So now President Kagame can uh, stay in power until 2034. Now, there was something even worse than that. There is something even worse than that in the, in the, amended, in the amendment. In the, amend, in the new constitution, they inserted, inserted what we call uh, Article 114, uh, and it's called uh, exemption from prosecution for a former head of state. The article reads, a former president of the republic cannot be prosecuted for treason or serious and deliberate violation of the constitution when no legal proceedings in respect of that offense were brought to him, uh, were brought against him while in office. But of course it cannot be brought against him while he's in, his, in the office because he's, he has immunity. So Kagame has immunized himself even after he leaves power. This, uh, this article basically gives him license to commit any crimes without any consequences. Why, 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 how do we explain this? Oh, by the way, incidentally, I, I must say uh, with a, a bit of uh, sick humor, uh, this, these constitutions are being made by amendments, are being made by the women majority parliament. These are women majority parliament at work. So the numbers of women is great, but the quality of work they do is rubber stamping the worst possible. Okay, so why is he doing this? We already know for that even to come here in the United States, Kagame had to be given immunity. The Obama administration up, uh, asserted immunity for him because there are already cases against in this case, uh, about the alleged role in shooting down the previous president. This is, this is the background behind this. But we also know that currently in the International Court of Justice, uh, the, there is a court uh, from Congo, by Congo, that accuses Kagame uh, the crime of killing 3.5 million people. Rwanda and, and Uganda were both taken to, 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 to this court. Rwanda, uh, Uganda pleaded its case and lost, and it's, be, it's, it's paying reparations. But Rwanda denied uh, um, jurisdiction over the court. So, but this, this, court, this case won't disappear. It's sitting there in, in there somewhere. So that is the, the, the context. That is the context. Then the elections themselves. I don't have to say much because a lot was covered. 99% uh, out of uh, 96 uh, voter turnout. Uh, this uh, begins now to take us closer to the situation of uh, North Korea. Oh, but the inc incidentally, this clause that uh, uh, frees Kagame from any prosecution, I have looked at Every, you know, the worst dictators, the, the worst dictatorship, I have not found any such, such uh, protection. Now, the elections themselves. I want to quote uh, the British ambassador. The British ambassador was among the observers of the elections. So I quote him. He says that, uh, uh, Along with, along with other international observers, I personally saw irregularities with the counting of ballots 
and voter tabulation. And then he concludes, we are concerned by the arrests and it is concerning to see the targeting of opposition figures. This is the British uh, ambassador in Rwanda. So I, I really don't have much to say, but now let me talk about post uh, elections. Uh, post election is now um, uh, revenge. It's a period of revenge. It's revenge big time. And revenge has a single doubt in particular. Diane uh, Shimaruigara. Why her? Why her? There are, there are a number of reasons why her. First of all, she is the one who dared to raise issues of democracy, issues of human rights, issues of moral corruption. And by, by moral corruption, she was saying that um, even in this economic miracle people talk about, the, the ruling party himself, itself has accumulated so much wealth the, uh, its conglomerate, uh, Crystal Venture, is now worth uh, 500 million. While the same government punishes and destroys other businesses. Uh, Ruigara's own father was killed two years ago in a mysterious accident. When the family protested, the government moved on and demolished their hotel. Uh, a month ago, another hotel of a competitor to the ruling party, Tower Hotel, demolished in broad daylight. Uh, just two days ago, the, biz the, the, the business the business of the, Lu the, the, the leading Rwandan businessman, Tribat Ruju Jiro Ayabatwa, his $20 million Union Trade Center, seized and auctioned uh, uh, for, for $8 million. So I guess I'm running out of time. I see some uh, signals there. So in, in conclusion, yeah? yeah. So, so, uh, <clears throat> What we have here is very costly experiment. Even those people who talk about uh, the good things, the women are in parliament. By the way, those women, are, no one is voted. That, that parliament is a list compiled by the ruling party. The senators, uh, half of them appointed. Don't confuse the senators in Rwanda with the senators in the United States or Congress people. No. These are lists, party lists. Those who are not elected by the president, they are elected by people he has painted in other institutions. So business success, absolutely not. Yes, if we talk about uh, president uh, traveling in a $60 million plane, rented from his own business at the taxpayer's uh, cost, if that is success, I don't think so. So what should the United States be, be doing? I think the, uh, the United States, in my view, uh, has overcompensated. During the Clinton years, uh, during genocide, the government stood by while terrible crimes were committed. Then comes Kagame. So now we have gone overboard. He can't, go no, he can't do no wrong. I think that uh, it's time that we look, take a closer look, <coughs> support Rwanda. We are not asking by any means to say stop health support or stop education. No. But the military the same military that we are supporting is the same military that is killing its own people. 
So what is, the, what, what is good with the military that is doing great in uh, Darfur um, when it's mulling down people in Rwanda and Congo? That, there, is a, there is a problem there. So, 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 I, so I, would say, I would simply say this. By, first of all, I, I conclude by thanking you very much for having this holding, hearing. But also let me say, thank the Congress because I believe that uh, in the budget law of 2017, there is a clause in there that says that uh, for any government in the Great Lakes region to receive military support, the State Department must verify if this government, if any government is causing havoc, uh, 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 they're not using those words, <laughs> is causing havoc in the neighborhood. So I, I, you, I think you ought to hold uh, the, 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 your State Department uh, accountable to if they, it's, see if they're doing this. Because we, we know for sure that uh, causing havoc in Burundi or in Congo has not stopped, which I'm sure my colleague here will say more about. I thank you so much for, for giving me a few minutes to talk. Mr. Hambera, thank you so very much for your testimony. I'd like to now recognize uh, Robert Higuero. Uh, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Mas, members of the subcommittee, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a testimony on democracy and human rights in Rwanda. I wish to give evidence my purpose today is to give evidence to the fact that democracy in Rwanda is impossible because of uh, the environment that exists in the country right now. The commander-in-chief and the Rwandan uh, security forces are part of the problem. Their purpose is not to provide security, but to rather to kill Rwandans and cause chaos in the region. Let me begin uh, with President Kagame himself. He's on the record saying after the 2016 State Department report, when they were concerned by disappearances, saying those who talk about disappearances are wasting time. As he puts it, we will shoot them, if possible, broad daylight. That's the president saying, I'm just quoting him, it's not my words, it's his words. We have seen a follow-up of his senior commanders, brigade commanders, division commanders, echoing the same tone, especially in uh, the western region. In the 2016 State Department's Human Rights Report gives the most recent realities in Rwanda. An increasing number of people have disappeared or have been reported missing since May 2015. That's our previous, since our previous hearing. Many of the cases occurred in Rav District in Western provinces. According to Human Rights Watch reports, most of these people were detained by Rwanda Defense Forces. And we believe that they are in military custody. Witnesses saw some of the local authorities participating in this activity. One was uh, the executive secretary in Rava district by the name of uh, Mujisha. He was seen taking part in those who were forcibly being kidnapped together with security agents. One Muhammad Munyengang was shot and killed while in, his, in, in custody. At least a half a dozen of people have been murdered by the security forces while in prison. Extrajudicial killings recently increased as the security forces killed the capital of Chigari. And major towns of poor people, unemployed, and the homeless. Authorities are rounding up pe poor people arbitrarily uh, detaining them in transit centers. They, they, they have transit centers across the country. In its 2017 report, Human Rights Watch proved chilling details of extrajudicial killings of 37 Rwandans suspected of petty offenses, 
such as stealing bananas or a car or a motorcycle in the Western province. Between, that was between July 2016 and 2017. Soldiers have continued to arrest and shoot most of the victims in what appears to be an official sanctioned strategy by the government. The crimes by the state against Rwandans never stops. And this includes dissidents, those inside the country as they go as far as Europe. That's why I'm here. I, I tried to run as far as possible, but they still come for you. We'll get a chance to elaborate on that. Rwanda's destabilization of neighboring countries has also not stopped, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Burundi. In the 2013 DRC, Rwanda disarmed over 770 M23 Congressable combatants. It had previously sponsored to take part or to take over eastern part of the DRC. After the defeat of M23, over 770 crossed into Rwanda, the same number, and were detained in Ngoma. According to the 2016 State Department report, the same number mysteriously vanished. There can be no doubt about their role. There are Rwandans' prox army used to destabilize the neighbors. In the case of Burundi, Rwanda stand accused of recruiting Burundian refugees into the armed groups who seek to overthrow the government of President Pierre Nkurunziza. In its report, Asylum Betrayed, recruitment of Burundian refugees in Rwanda Refugees International built Rwanda in the following terms. The Rwandan government must act at once to ensure the civilian and humanitarian character of asylum and, pro and protected refugees from recruitment by non-state armed actors. To that end, it must ensure that all efforts to recruit Burundian refugees into armed groups, whether on or emanating from Rwandan territory, and whether committed by Burundian or Rwandan nationals seize immediately. That was Refugees International. Rwanda must also affirm publicly that the recruitment of refugees in two non-state armed groups on its ter territory is a violation of international and Rwandan law. Mr. Chairman, I know a lot has been said. I can't repeat what has been said whether it's on the political aspect or the corruption. That's why I want to conclude by thanking you once again for conducting this congressional hearing on Rwanda. We trust that the United States, being the main donor to Rwanda, will make its support conditional to ending terror on its own people and the region. Thank you very much. Tegara, thank you <coughs> very much for your testimony and for your insights. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Jobins. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass, and, and guests, it's, a, it's an honor to join you today, and uh, I thank you for, for the work uh, to shine a candle to the crises facing Africa uh, and its Great Lakes region. I've been before you before on Burundi and CAR, and greatly appreciate uh, you maintaining the attention there. Uh, my name is Mike Jobbins, and for the last nine years, uh, I've worked with Search for Common Ground throughout Africa uh, and around the world. Uh, Search is a conflict transformation organization, and we work to support peace reconciliation and inclusive governance here in America and in 44 countries around the world. Uh, the testimony that follows is informed by my experience with search, um, but the opinions are my own, and I ask that the written testimony be entered into the record. Search was founded on the philosophy that conflict is an inevitable part of human societies, and our aim is to promote the positive aspects of conflict uh, through dialogue, inclusive decision-making, and creative thinking while preventing the negative aspects, including violence, oppression, and humanitarian suffering. We prioritized the Great Lakes beginning in 1995, opening our first office in Bujumbura as the region was racked by one of the worst periods of destructive conflict uh, that the recent history has seen and made a long-term commitment, expanding to Rwanda in 2006 with the aim of supporting inclusive decision-making and reconciliation efforts. 
uh, following the, you know, the, the tragic genocide. Over the past decade, Search worked with Rwandan media, government, civil society, and local communities to support reconciliation, address land disputes, build the capacity of civil society and government institutions, with a particular focus on youth and women in rural areas. Um, and in, in preparing today, I was asked to speak specifically uh, to our work in Rwanda focused on economic and social rights, particularly around land, as well as on supporting the reconciliation and post-conflict governance on the ground that affect ordinary Rwandans in the country. Uh, and so my te testimony will focus primarily on those, those topics. And to set the scene, Rwanda is the most densely populated country in Africa, has been noted. A, to bring that home, it's slightly smaller than the state of Maryland, with twice as many people, nearly all of whom are dependent on subsistence agriculture. Uh, and the population is growing uh, quickly. When I started first uh, working in Rwanda 10 years ago, uh, there were 9 million Rwandans. Today, there are 12 million. And uh, you know, that's 33% growth in, in just 10 years. So it's growing quickly, and the underlying math is very clear. Uh, Rwandans needed and, and still need rapid economic diversification and growth, uh, as well as a, a system to effectively manage land disputes uh, and, and competition in the stresses that rural populations were feeling uh, as population grows and resources became depleted. Uh, and yet, despite the structural challenges in a dense, landlocked, and post-conflict country, Rwanda experienced uh, a dramatic economic transformation. In the last 15 years, according to the World Bank numbers, the economy has quintupled, with the GDP growing from $1.3 billion uh, to $8.3 billion a year. And a lot of that has been driven by a transition away from subsistence economy and commodity exports and towards greater value-add services, uh, cognizant and, and relevant to the, the sort of the stresses on, uh, on rural agriculture. Uh, economic growth has been facilitated, as, as Congresswoman Bass highlighted, by a regulatory environment that supports business, entrepreneurship, in, in line with the government's Vision 2020. At the same time, in the context of scarcity, disputes over the allocation, access, and ownership of land uh, are, are remain the most common cause of conflict for ordinary Rwandans. The government has tried to address this issue by adopting policies and putting in place local conflict mediators known as abunzi. Uh, and these mediators are put on the front lines of solving serious disputes among stressed rural populations faced with large caseloads, varying degrees of training, and confronted with serious social obstacles, particularly around gender. Uh, while women are legally entitled to inherit property, and as noted, there's been a great emphasis on women's political participation, the right isn't always ne necessarily recognized or respected in practice. Uh, due to traditional norms and struggles that ordinary rural women have uh, to access justice. And so to support uh, alternative dispute resolution, Search partnered with the Ministry of Justice to support 4,000 Abunzi mediators, including female uh, Abunzi, to support and train uh, community resource people who could serve as advocates uh, for the socioeconomic rights of marginalized groups, and particularly for women, uh, to produce radio programming to ensure that rural residents understand land laws and policies and have the opportunity to ask questions and raise concerns. Uh, and finally, to build problem-solving skills so that communities and families can address land conflicts themselves without referring uh, to an overstretched or, or overstretching the justice system. Uh, at the same time, it's clear that given demographic pressure, agriculture in its current form will not sustain Rwanda's uh, growing population. There's been an important focus uh, from the government and from its international partners on developing alternative livelihoods uh, and trying to ensure equal access to opportunities, um, particularly for rural youth and women uh, to benefit from the economic uh, transformation. Uh, but in, as in all societies undergoing rapid uh, high technology economic change, the poorest and least educated struggle to take advantage of the new opportunities in the service-oriented, global, uh, globalized, and educationally intensive economy. Impediments uh, faced by, by many Rwandans include a lack of information and access to opportunities, a lack of capital and education to seize those opportunities, and a lack of exposure to role models and examples of entrepreneurship uh, to roll those out and take them to scale. And so looking forward, alternative livelihoods is critical, and, and the kinds of partnerships of the kind we've been developing with the private sector and media to help ensure that Rwandans uh, from the lowest socioeconomic brackets have information access to take advantage of the opportunities available. In terms of reconciliation uh, and post-conflict governance, Rwanda's rec recovery from the horrific genocide 23 years ago has been held as a modern-day success story, uh, both in reconciliation and good governance. 
Uh, some of the statistics have been thrown out earlier. I, I'd also add that Rwanda ranks 44th uh, out of, on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, uh, some of the best scores of any African country. Uh, and, and this has been uh, achieved through uh, a governance model that focuses on and prioritizes professional results-oriented uh, and technocratic governance with so strong central leadership in policy making and implementation. The strong coordinating role that the central government plays across society has helped stamp out petty corruption and drive a, a coherent policy vision and agenda. Uh, but Vision 2020 also establishes a vision for decentralization and ownership, local ownership of government policy. Ordinary local officials face the difficult task in balancing the emphasis on efficiency and results with the need for the more cumbersome process of creating opportunities for citizen inputs, engagement, and explaining policies to ordinary people. The best Rwandan administrators established two-way com uh, communications with their citizens to tailor and shape policy re implementation, but in other circumstances, citizens struggle to find a window to feed into decision-making uh, in, in, an, in an environment where there's not uh, a robust policy uh, a discussion. Socially, Rwanda has made admirable progress in reconciling citizens from different backgrounds who have to live together in their communities uh, despite the atrocities of the past. Hundreds of thousands of people have been punished for crimes committed, and on a day-to-day -day level, many people are moving on with their lives. At the same time, barely a generation has passed, a short time frame to overcome the horror that's been experienced. And while the country has set aside ethnic identity in fervor of national unity, recovery naturally takes time, and there's an awful lot that, that remains to be done over, over the generations to come. Media and civil society uh, are absolutely critical to creating the space for dialogue both about the past and about the policy issues to lay a bedrock for sustainable peace, participatory government, uh, and effective long-term governance. Uh, since 2006, we've built strong partnerships with local government and independent radio outlets based or, and focused on building alliances based on shared interests. But it's imperative that there are capable organizations to facilitate sensitive dialogues on air and in person in an open environment. And so we strengthen the capacity of media and civil society to work with authorities and work with authorities themselves uh, to engage the population in a constructive and inclusive manner. In view of these few observations, and uh, happy to share more, I want to sort of make four uh, recommendations in, in conclusion for US policy. First, sustaining US diplomatic engagement in Rwanda and the region is vital. I think there, there's unanimity um, from everyone in the room on that point. Uh, although there are many competing demands for attention in, in the Great Lakes region alone and let alone across Africa, uh, this region can't be, be forgotten and, and it deserves a high level focus. Within the region, adequate staffing and resources, both within the regional bureaus as well as within the embassies and USAID missions across the region. While it may seem remote to many Americans, the horrors of genocide, civil war, and humanitarian crises that have been unleashed and are still being unleashed in many parts of Central Africa have cost far too many lives, but also cost far too many dollars in international assistance focused on short-term uh, palliation of, of chronic crises rather than putting the region and its people on a path to a greater recovery. Second, there's some things that, that the US government and that the Congress should learn from the experience of, of conflict and, and recovery in Rwanda. Many conflict countries and, and fragile contexts have been beset by seesawing international attention focused on immediate short-term recovery, but not sustaining a holistic engagement to economic recovery, political uh, participation and reconciliation that are needed to sustainably transition from fragility. That's something that needs, both, that needs administrative action, but also congressional action to authorize and to support a holistic approaches to, to conflict and fragility in, in the Great Lakes region and beyond. We recognize and appreciate the leadership that the Congress has shown on women, peace, and security, and, and salute the bill that just passed uh, earlier this week. And we also recognize the, uh, uh, the Eli Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, which has been introduced uh, back in May, uh, and can really make good on the U.S. commitment to never again. Um, third, regional economic integration is, is critical, given the context of density, population density across the region, the need for radical economic transformation and a shared economic transformation. It's very clear that regional cooperation, which at the moment is at, uh, is quite beset between uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, DRC, and, and beyond, requires better cooperation across borders, but also people-to-people -people reconciliation uh, to stabilize uh, the wider region. Uh, and finally, um, it's absolutely critical that the U.S. government continue its support and accompaniment of Rwanda 
in overcoming the legacy of genocide and in reconciling itself to the horrific events of the past. It, even though Rwanda has made much process, uh, progress in dealing with the aftermath of genocide and the series of massacres that have marked its history, the horrific past and the related trauma still affect other avenues to lasting peace and stability in, in Rwanda and in the region. Atrocities of this history and their consequences should pave the way to a much more open society where conflicts and differences can be dealt with openly and through dialogue. The US Congress should focus its engagement in working with the Rwandan government and supporting the Rwandan people uh, to build a brighter future and, and to achieve this goal together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Atkwe. Thank you. I'd like to thank you both uh, for this opportunity to speak before your committee and also to acknowledge and thank your consistent engagement and leadership on issues related to Africa, human rights, and U.S. Africa policy, which has been and continues to be essential and greatly appreciated. Amnesty International is a global human rights movement established in 1961 with 7 million members and supporters. We have a presence in 70 countries and have offices in Dakar, Nairobi, Johannesburg, and Abuja. We have been working to improve the respect and protection of human rights in Rwanda since the early 1970s. Amnesty does not take a position on the type of political system a country may have. It is our belief that fundamental human rights must be guaranteed and upheld by all political systems. We do consider the rights associated with elections, such as freedom of expression, association, assembly, among others, to be critical not only to the election itself, but also to the, also to the overall health and of open political space. The way governments engage with critics and voices of dissent, how they interact with civil society and treat human rights defenders are critical indicators that go beyond a single election. With your permission, I'd like to ask that our, long, our written testimony be submitted to the record. Without objection, it's ordered. The August 4th elections granted incumbent Paul Kagame his third term in office. This followed the referendum in 2015, which changed the Constitution, allowing President Kagame to stand again in 2017 and for two further terms, should he desire to do so. In 2010, President Kagame won 93% of the vote. In 2017, he won 99%. During the 23 years the Rwandan Patriotic Front has moved, ruled the, the country, there have been an unwavering and often brutal campaign against government critics and human rights defenders. This campaign has included attacks on political opposition members, included arrest, detention, disappearances and killings, restrictions on the media and the activities of civil society organizations, and the creation of a climate of fear. These concerns have been echoed by other human rights groups and the United States Department of State, which noted in its 2016 report, government harassment, arrest, and abuse of political opponents human rights advocates, individuals perceived to be a threat to the government's control and social order, restrictions on the media, and the civil liberties. The attacks and the campaign have included, as mentioned above, attacks on the political opposition and, of course, the restrictions on the media and civil society. In 2010, Amnesty reported that the authorities tightly controlled political space in advance of the 2010 elections. Freedom of expression was unduly restricted by broad laws on genocide ideology. Human rights defenders continued to exercise self-censorship to avoid confrontation with the authorities, and conventional courts still fell fair, short of fair trial standards. In 2011, we reported that authorities restricted freedom of expression and association. B media outlets that criticized the government were closed down, editors fled, human rights defenders faced intimidation, investigations into killings were inadequate. In 2012, Amnesty reported that the Rwandan government increasingly prosecuted individuals for criticizing government policies and that there was a rise in unlawful detentions. Violations included restrictions that were imposed on freedom of expression, arrest, unfair convictions of opposition politicians and of journalists. In 2013, Amnesty reported that the government still continued to stifle legitimate freedom of expression and associations that the illegal detention and the allegations of torture by Rwandan military intelligence were not investigated. This was the same year that the Rwandan government was also found by the UN group of experts to have provided military support to the M23 armed group in the neighboring Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was linked to rape, extrajudicial execution, and the use of child soldiers. 
The government's crackdown and restrictions on expression, assembly, and association, repression of journalists, human rights defenders, and members of the opposition parties who openly criticized the ruling government, use of unfair trials and unlawful detentions were raised in our reports of 2014, 2015, and 2016. In 2017, we reported on the severe restrictions that we thought were going to color and shape the run-up to the elections. This was the result of over of many years of the same types of actions. It is time for the international community to press the Rwandan government to change. Some have argued that Rwanda is still emerging from the 1994 genocide. Others have argued that because Rwanda is doing well economically, the current administration should be given more latitude. These arguments must be rejected as they subvert the common obligation to stand for rights accepted to be universal and that countries have committed themselves to, including Rwanda. Amnesty International has called upon the government of Rwanda to embark upon a longer-term reform process to open up political space before the 2024 elections and, as you mentioned, before the 2018 parliamentary elections and strengthen basic protections of rights beyond those. The concerns I have outlined impact more than the next election, and addressing them will require more than a temporary easing of some laws, the release of a few people, or even the permission to register a political party or an NGO. The assault on defenders and, and political space is quickening, and Rwanda is becoming a role model for the wrong things as opposed to the right things. It is not good for Africa, it is not good for the United States, or for the global community, as history is littered with many examples of countries where political intolerance has led to political conflict, and that has been extremely damaging. The global community failed Rwanda once before. It should not do so again. Specifically, we would like to suggest that, the con that Congress and the Trump administration call on President Kagame and the government of Rwanda to prevent and ease restrictions on or the harassment of members of the political opposition, their supporters, on journalists and human rights defenders, and establish an independent judicial investigative mechanism into serious violations of freedom of expression, assembly, and association. We have named a number of specific individuals who have disappeared that should be investigated. Congress and the administration should also urge the Rwandan government to decriminalize defamation offenses in the review of the Rwandan Penal Code. We would also urge the United States to call on the Rwandan government to reform the law on public assemblies and to remove the requirement for prior authorization for public assemblies and instead adopt a, a regime of prior notification. We would also urge Congress to maintain and increase funding for programs focused on building respect for human rights, the rule of law, and independence of the judiciary. I would like to echo my colleague from Search who raised the issue of building the capacity of civil society and the media. These are critical institutions if, and have to play their role in establishing, along with the Rwandan government, the good governance, human rights, and the respect for the rule of law. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Akwe, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for, and all of you for your tremendous uh, input today. I do have a few questions I'd like to ask. One, um, I am concerned, um, and I have deep respect for Ambassador Yamamoto, um, that we seem to be overvaluing State Department, the U.S. government. Uh, some facts like the participation of the Democratic Green Party, uh, which got approximately 1% of the vote. Uh, others who wanted to participate were precluded that opportunity. And then, as he said, the, uh, the, the carrying of, uh, the holding to account some of the harassment of opposition candidates that was reported in the Rwandan media. Whether or not that's true, I still don't know. Uh, was it a report, false report, uh, sensational report that, oh, we're holding uh, officials to account? Uh, that's, not, that's not clear. But even in his own testimony, he goes on to say, as I quoted earlier, since the election, Rwandan authorities have targeted several political opposition figures for questioning and arrest. And then he goes on and, and uh, very accurately quotes from the country reports on human rights practices, pointing out um, arbitrary or unlawful killings by security forces disregard for the rule of law, restrictions on civil society organizations, government interference with the press, which Mr. Akwe again and others have already made in, in their testimonies in terms of the crackdown on journalists. Um, it's hard to call that some progress, frankly, when it seems to be going in the precisely opposite direction, where the 
percentage of the vote gleaned by the president goes even higher than the previous one, and he's in for life um, uh, based on the constitutional changes. Uh, your thoughts on that, because I think we sometimes turn the page far too quickly, if it should be turned at all, and we're willing to look at one little seemingly bright, shiny object uh, that's, that's, that we can then cling to, and, and it's a surface appeal argument, that, that, that it has surface appeal that the, that the Green Party participated, but what about all the others? Um, you know, it's a talking point that a, that a lobbyist might want to uh, push forward before a less than critical uh, set of eyes and ears. So I, I'm concerned about that. Your thoughts on that, overvaluing uh, this, what I think is regression, not progress, uh, by the Kagame regime. Secondly, the, as you pointed out, um, Mr. Himbara, uh, and I should have asked the ambassador, well, I will by way of uh, a written question, when you pointed out and brought further attention to Article 114, uh, which seemingly gives, uh, not seemingly, gives immunity, which often means impunity, because if you're not going to be held to account ever for anything you do in office, including rape, having your soldiers rape and kill, uh, and extrajudicial killings and the like, <laughs> you know, you're above the law completely for life. Uh, that needs to be, you know, much more further e emphasized in our bilateral and hopefully in a multilateral way uh, with, um, with Rwandans, if any of you would like to comment on that. And I thought your point, uh, Mr. Akwe, about how the, and I quoted it earlier, but it bears repeating, um, you know, when you say, and you have so brilliantly reported on severe restrictions on human rights defenders and the media and the like, and you've done it uh, painstakingly, you also point out to the international community, including Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama administrations have been at best half-hearted in confronting President Kagame and pressing the Rwandan government to reform its policy regarding human rights and political space. You know, those kinds of, of um, omissions on the part of bipartisan administrations is unconscionable. Because at the end of the day, people get killed, women get raped, get abused, people go to prison, journalists get harassed, and the people don't get the truth because the journalists are, uh, it has a chilling effect on how they write. So if you could speak to that as well, because now we have a new administration, um, doesn't have all of his people in place yet, uh, but we need to say clearly and unmistakably to the new White House, don't repeat the bipartisan error of the past, um, you know, because we'll get the same outcome, we'll get more impunity. Um, so uh, whoever would like to go first, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, very often we talk about uh, a smoking gun. Looking, for, I think uh, Article 114 is a smoking gun. Uh, Article 14, as you said, it's an impunity. I looked in preparation for this uh, hearing. I looked in uh, on. I read as many constitutions as I could find anywhere, uh, including even the Constitution of the Democratic Republic of North Korea. I could not find a constitution that gives a green light to a head of state, not only, uh, not only uh, to commit crimes while in office, but also uh, after he has left office. So I would assume that uh, he's probably thinking that after he leaves office, he will probably put in a puppet that would f refuse uh, to enforce international laws. You, they then say, look, you can't touch him here, he's here. Because as I said, there are cases here already in the US. And in the US, this is a country where even a sitting president can face law. Hmm? <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> so a president can face law. Um, so really, if, if, if uh, the United States, or even the United Kingdom, this, this is a country that uh, Rwanda is a member of the Commonwealth. How does the Commonwealth allow a country that gives a green light crim to criminality 
on the part of the head of state and get away with it. So here, I would say that we should, we should begin right there. Uh, we campaign for the removal of this because it's either you want to be president and lead and build the economy and do these wonderful things, empower women, that is great. But if you make a mistake, you cannot be above the law. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Normally, I like to go into the details of if what uh, Mr. Jobans just said, if what the State Department just said is true, whether it's development, building institutions in Rwanda, so what's the problem? Why, are, why is it that things are not working? I asked him before this started that if Rwanda can really develop so quickly, like uh, they're saying, it's a landlocked country, we have neighbors, how do they do it? How do they do it that Burundi can't copy that, or Tanzania, or Uganda, or DRC? What's the magic? And if there is no issue, why are we here? So I like bringing to this committee exactly what I'm worried about. One, President Kagame criminalizes Rwandans. And we all know, when you push people to the wall, what happens? How did we get to 1994? What really happened to get to 1994? It's this. We talk about issues, and people choose which side they want to be on. They choose which truth they want to bring out. But we all know that Rwandans, personally, I can talk about the genocide because I was there. Sometimes Rwandans will talk about genocide, you know, people have different views. But when it comes to me as a soldier who tried to rescue people during genocide, I fought in the capital city for three months before we took over. I know exactly what happened. I know how the Tutsis were being killed. I know other crimes. Then, we have what happened from 94 to death. Again, I served until 2010. When I was decommissioned, I was serving the United Nations. I was a peacekeeper. I had two tours in Darfur. One as a commander of soldiers, another one as a staff officer, heading the sector's information we, I know a lot of that. I know how they work. I know the discipline of the Rwandan soldiers. I know where it comes from. And what I've been striving to give you and the State Department and other elements of the government is the truth. What people have to do with it is not up to me. But Kagame knows all this. He knows we're going to come here and make good speeches talk about the, the corruption and, you know, he'll say corruption is everywhere in the world. And most of the people who still go to Rwanda, it doesn't matter where you're working. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you're Rwandan. In most cases, they will never criticize Rwanda. Do you know why? Because that's the end. The previous uh, regional representative of Great X region Literally, Kagame made him fail to do his job. You either say what he's telling you, or you don't come back. And it doesn't matter which level they're on. Now, criminalizing Rwandans is in two ways. The Hutus, if you follow deeply, most of them are concerned to talk about the current situation. Why? The moment you do that, you become a genocider. They fabricate cases for the, for the Hutus, and most, some of them have been deported from the United States. I've tried to engage with the United States government about these cases, because the least we need, we're not saying we're supporting those who participated in genocide, no. We are saying we need fair justice. Try them here, right? Because there's no justice in Rwanda, no. That's the problem. So the Hutus have to keep quiet because they are genociders. That's it. No defense at all. 
everybody, even those who were born today, the, Kagame himself said, even their children have to be responsible for their parents' crimes. So up to when are Hutus going to be free? We don't know, as long as they're still living. Now, the second criminalization of Rwandans is the Tutsis. Today, the opposition political parties in the diaspora, some of them have sympathizers inside the country, have raised the paranoia in the, in, in, in the country to the government. So even these uh, recent arrests, for example, Diane Rigara, I'm very sure soon you hear that she's part of uh, those political parties. We have a group of five political parties who form the coalition. And it's increasingly becoming stronger and you know, they are gaining voice. I've spoke this or discussed this with the State Department because we always say, what's the alternative? Should we just say Kagame is bad and that's it? No, Rwandans have alternatives. They have seen that there's no Hutu government which is going to work. There's no Tutsi government which is going to work. That country was made for them both. The reconciliation he talked about is a fake reconciliation. There is no way you can say that there's a reconciliation in Rwanda. By picking a Hutu to become a prime minister every single term, or some of them, he changes them in the middle of the term, does not mean reconciliation. When Kagame has rallies in the western region where it's predominant Hutu, the Hutus showing up, it's a military operation. They start beating them up and driving them to the scene around midnight when Kagame is going to appear the next day around three. Yes, that's what happens. So. Everything we see is a show. What they do, what, they, what Rwanda is concerned about, the, the Rwandan government is concerned with two issues. When you get $400 million and you construct a, a, a trade center, a conventional center, $400 million, what you do, what you're doing is protecting, showing the image of the country, right? Because 400 million dollars can do a lot to the population, be it school, health, water, everything that they are lacking in the interior. So the image of the country, that's what they show. Everybody who goes to Rwanda. Two, the image of the president. It's only him who can do it, no one else. That's what they fight for. If you don't do it, that's it. It doesn't now, today, it's not about the Hutus and the Tutsis. It's everybody. We have concerns with what's happening to families of these people who have already been killed, like it has been mentioned, you know? We have uh, issues in the military. Four colonels were, were recently arrested and taken to unknown locations. It's in my uh, submitted report. Many generals and colonels are out of job. And that's why I say that where we are today in Rwanda is where we are just before 94. Suppose anything happened in Rwanda. Suppose Kagame got sick and died. What happens? with all this tension. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. And um, just to, to focus on, on two things, I think one is a, as we look at political discourse and, and the um, political life in Rwanda today, um, it, uh, the way that we engage on, on these questions is, is fundamentally Conflict and the reconciliation, there's no such thing as a success in con conflict resolution or, or reconciliation, neither here in America nor Europe nor anywhere. It's an ongoing process. Every political environment uh, needs continual support. 
uh, to engage and develop a discourse that's healthy to participatory decision making and uh, to engagement. Rwanda is no different from those. And I think, m particularly as we look at the political life of, of ordinary Rwandans, to view as sort of a dichotomous, uh, absolutely success, absolutely failure, um, misses some of the nuance that characterizes every society um, where we uh, uh, where we if live you, and, and work. You don't mind yielding briefly. My thought was that we give undue value, uh, excessive applause, to extraordinarily minor steps, while the steps backwards are very profound. Thanks. No, I, I absolutely. He expects you know it's almost a straw man to think that any of us think there's no perfection. Uh, we we strive to it, but when things are going in the wrong direction, that that was the essence of the question. No, thanks. I, I really appreciate that, and I mean, I just um, uh, what I I wanted to sort of just underscore is as we look at one of the things that's at least most vexing to us is as we look at land, which is a life and death issue to ordinary Rwandans, um, the degree to which citizens understand necessarily the policies that that impact them and have an opportunity to uh, to input into them. Our thing is, is, is a continual um, a process and quite uneven in terms of uh, the way in which local governments, the way in which media and others engage with citizens and lay that groundwork and bedrock for an informed policy debate. And so beyond sort of the policy and the political debates around uh, elections, one of the things that we look for and particularly you know, in the US uh, focus on democracy and governance and the, and the partnership with Rwanda in the context of dwindling resources, as Congresswoman Bass highlighted, is ensuring that there's adequate attention on building civil society capacity, supporting media to, to cultivate and to build a, a, a context of, of, of constructive political discourse, both around development, but also around the decisions that the government takes. That's something that's in line with the vision that's been laid out uh, by the government, but one where we see uh, a need for, for continued improvement. I think there's almost no a place on earth, I might say, where the media environment is, um, you know, has played a more negative role in, in you know, in the, the genocide. It was certainly uh, a profound thinking for our own organization, how we engage in, in the role that media plays in societies, and almost no place where the social discourse had been as inflamed and deliberately inflamed. Um, and, and so there's almost no place on earth where more attention needs to be paid to carving out and rebuilding a constructive media space, a constructive civil society and free expression space uh, for citizens to really own and contribute to their own development in partnership with their government, but also in partnership uh, with civil society and, and with other actors. Um, thank you very much for the questions. I think um, I'll, I'll just try and focus on the, the, the record of the previous administrations, which I know um, you in particular and, and Congresswoman Bass have fought very hard to try to correct. Um, a very good colleague and uh, Africa expert once told me that good friends don't let good f their friends do bad things to themselves. Um, and I think this is what happened, um, that there was, as uh, one of the previous panelists mentioned, there was an overcompensation after 1994. Um, there were regional tensions that were genuine and credible, and the Rwandan uh, Patriotic Front had the capacity and the ability to basically be a a force for stability. Um, but that was also accompanied by what Representative Bass said were genuine, incredibly impressive numbers in terms of um, economic, social, and cultural rights uh, progress. Um, no, one is, no one is disputing that. The, the, the challenge, I think, was that it became an either or. In other words, you are either in support of what were seen as e an economic superstar and any criticism of that was seen as a criticism of everything, which is extremely unfortunate because what government and what country cannot have flaws as well as successes? Africa has no difference. Um, and I think this has also become <coughs> part, unfortunately, of the mindset of the government that critiques or questions about certain policies tend to be equated with critiques about the government itself, whether legitimate or not. And that has descended into a, um, a reticence uh, from both uh, going back to the Clinton administration and the Bush administrations and the Obama administrations where there was a reluctance um, or whether it was very, it, it was almost a, a, a struggle to get them to challenge and to actually take the, the report, Department of State reports, which consistently documented 
the shortcomings and do something about it. And I think your, your point is right. We may not, be, we may not have, to have the luxury to discuss the past, but we have the present and the future, and the Trump administration has to adopt a different tact because, as our colleagues have said, the pressure is building. There are trends now where the political space is closing, and Rwanda is usually referred to as the epicenter. Um, and that, I think, is, is, is extremely alarming because, as one of my colleagues just said, wasn't that similar to where we were just before 94 when there was no space and no ability to engage in dialogue? Not simplifying things, but that's not where we want to go back to. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to ask in, in terms of the, the government and from the perspective of the U.S., what type of external pressure and which messengers tend to have the most positive impact? And I would ask that of Mr. Jobbins. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, I don't, in terms of what we see as being constructive, the, the challenges, uh, there's a, an over, uh, there's a risk in overestimating uh, the role that external players and external pressure can play uh, on shifting a, a political environment or in assuming that uh, all that's needed is political will uh, rather than also forging a, a political way. Uh, and so even, you know, I, I think some of my colleagues have spoken about the concerns about public discourse, self-censorship, like Adite highlighted, but that's also about encouraging public uh, positive models, supporting examples of uh, uh, of how citizens have engaged in creating role models that can uh, craft and, and foster uh, a proper, you can foster a constructive participation from citizens to their own development and to uh, the, the ultimate sort of co contribute to political life. So let me ask you a little bit about that because I believe your organization is engaged in some of that. And so I wanted to know how you would assess the progress of reconciliation and peace building in Rwanda and how it might compare with other countries in the region? Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think as many of you know, um, you know, Rwanda has taken uh, a very different, different um, tact, for example, its, its colleagues or the, the neighbor to the south in, in Burundi. There's been a very strong consensus forged in Rwanda to move beyond an identification of the past with, with Hutu mm -hmm. and Tutsi. Uh, a craft a national uh, identity that we're all we're all Rwandans. That's something um, that characterizes Rwandan society today. It's something that, uh, for, from interactions with Rwandans uh, myself and 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 others, it seems to be something that's broadly accepted. We've worked with uh, the national uh, with NERC, the National Unity and Reconciliation Council, um, and it's one um, that's obviously a different tack from how, for example, we deal with difference here in America. Here we talk explicitly about racial differences. We also talk about our own history in a way that's different, for example, from Brazil that's experienced similar differences. Every society um, deals and defines whether it's class, religion, uh, race, ethnicity. The divisions that, that make it up are phrased differently and understood differently um, as, a as a legacy of history, as a legacy of culture, and as a deliberate choice about the vocabulary that people choose to use to describe themselves and to, to describe their neighbors. Um, the the push towards reconciliation uh, and to move beyond that that framing is is from all that that we can see s appears to be in, in the surveys that we've done is is quite genuine and felt by organizing Rwanda by by ordinary Rwandans the desire to prevent the memory of the genocide the desire to prevent that mm -hmm. uh, again animates political life but that doesn't mean that there's not path dependency that doesn't mean that where you are today is completely divorced from where your family was 25 years ago uh, and so there is a degree of, of differences linked to the past that, that can only be really addressed. I know that they're going to yeah. they're going to call That's votes in a minute, but I appreciate yeah. that. And Mr. Uh, Higuro, um, I think I heard you say that um, some of the opponents of Kagame have been deported from the U.S. Did you say that? Uh, no, it was not the opponents. The Hutus who have cases uh, linked to uh, genocide crimes. Uh huh. Yes, which have been fabricated. Oh, oh, I see. Yes. They, they were deported from here? Yes. Recently? Um, it's about a few months. Okay. The, the last case I know at least is a few months. 
And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's certainly anybody in this room that feels that there's not a ton of problems that have to be dealt with in Rwanda. And as I stated in the beginning, I think our chairman laid it all out. Uh, but I am concerned, though, that if you paint a country as completely negative in this political environment that we're in, where they're calling for, you know, uh, the administration is calling for a 30 percent cut in the State Department, that you know you can have a situation where people just walk away too, and I don't think that that would be positive. You know, on any account, people have to feel as though there's some hope. Otherwise, you know, what's what's the point? Um, so that, that those are my, my only questions. I, I do have to say though that I I thought it was rather unfortunate that you seem to be pretty dismissive of the women parliamentarians um, in Rwanda who I meet with. I mean, they come here as I meet with parliamentarians and women leaders from around the world. And um, I don't doubt the, um, you know, the fact that it might be a rubber stamp, but I, I don't think that the women view themselves as uh, irrelevant. So, and I do think that women around the world do look at that number and think that it's pretty impressive. I yield back my time. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just ask one final thought, or question I should say. You know, um, <clears throat> Much has been, many have mentioned, including our ambassador, um, the plight of Diane Rivahara. And if I got, if I have this correct, uh, she has pointed out that uh, she has criticized Kagame and his ruling uh, Rwanda Patriotic Front for acquiring $500 million business empire, Crystal Venture. Uh, I introduced the bill just the other day, uh, this week, on Azerbaijan's ongoing and egregious uh, human rights abuses, particularly the political prisoners. And when I introduced the similar bill in the last Congress and um, it was roundly criticized by the Baku government, um, I had met in Azerbaijan a journalist, Kaija, who had exposed uh, Aliyev's corruption. She was a, a reporter for Radio Free uh, Europe and we had a hearing with, when she was incarcerated uh, and the head of Radio Free Europe came to this room and testified. Uh, she was eventually freed. I don't know how free she remains, uh, but journalists who take that kind of risk, she had gotten a seven and a half year prison sentence. No mention was made by the White House to protest it, although Radio Free Europe did, thank God. Uh, so my. Uh, uh, and, and I often find when you raise an issue that is country specific, they somehow think you have some uh, ill will towards that country. And certainly Azerbaijan did that. Vietnam does it routinely when I introduce the Vietnam Human Rights Act. When I introduce, which is passed three times in the U.S. House, never got past the Senate. Uh, when I wrote the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004, which held the Yukushenko's uh, government to account and imposed visa denials and very significant economic sanctions against his businesses. Um, he denounced it, and I was just in Belarus, um, you know, uh, uh, just a, a few months ago. Um, and we're getting the same kind of pushback from Rwanda, that somehow we're singling out, and I do it with China. I've done it with many countries around the world where I've had country-specific human rights bills, some of which have become law, like Belarus. Um, and, and now the most recent one this week was on, on Azerbaijan, and last time, like I said, it was roundly and, and derisively uh, criticized by, by uh, the Baku government. Kagame's got the same view. This has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, anything but compassion and empathy and concern for the people of Rwanda, uh, that they deserve better. Uh, so my question is, you know, we've talked about the human rights situation, uh, the, the attacks on journalists, the attacks on individual people, um, the attacks that Mr. Higaro um, uh, and the, the threats that he faced. Um, my, my question is, do we know if Paul Kagame has amassed a fortune anywhere? Um, uh, you know, that we often find even Yasser Arafat, who is supposedly fighting tooth and nail on behalf of the Palestinian people, Upon his death, we learned that he had amassed a fortune that would have been well utilized for the people of, 
of, of um, uh, under the PLA at the time, or PLO, I should say, at the time, under their control. Uh, and yet he was a rich man, and we find that all over the world. Um, I, I, so do you have any information, or could you, if necessary, get back to the committee uh, about Kagami's personal fortune? Does he have one? Yes. Um, when the Panama Papers came out, uh, I think it was last year, uh, something extraordinary happened. Uh, he is the only president uh, of our, in Africa that I know of that featured. Uh, his, uh, his assistants, um, and I say it was extraordinary because elsewhere uh, there was uproar uh, about Panama Papers. But because of the situation in Uganda, no single paper would even dare discuss the Panama Papers. It took uh, zero, no, nothing. Now, for the record, what was contained within the Panama Papers? Oh, what was the concern is that um, he had, they, they have uh, offshore accounts that operate uh, aircraft, private aircraft. So, now, we know that uh, in uh, Crystal Venture, Crystal Venture is, um, it, it, the, the Kagame and RPF don't deny that Crystal Venture exists. Crystal Venture has more employees than even the central government. The, 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 this, is, this is open. Crystal Venture thrives on uh, cronyism, basically contracts from government. Any opposition, any competition crystal to Crystal Venture, destroyed. <laughs> so what, what is going on there is that even these uh, clean, uh, clean uh, uh, records of corruption? See, the rep what they report about is cro uh, I mean, is petty corruption. But when we when it talks to when we talk when we talk about uh, institutionalized corruption, uh, then we are talking about something else. The Chris Venture is in the open. Crystal Venture has two aircraft. This is known, 60, 60 million apiece. And what do these two aircraft do? They shuttle the president. So the president basically rents his aircraft from, so there is Kagame the president renting aircraft from Kagame, the, the chairman of Crystal Venture. So what's extraordinary is that all this is in the open. Now, the, the problem is that uh, no media in Rwanda would dare uh, talk about this. But foreign media is doing this. I refer to The Economist. Uh, two months ago, I, I think the title is uh, um, no, I, 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 but I'll, I'll, I'll send it, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll refer to the committee. The case of Crystal Venture, the, the, the case of, uh, you know, like um, transfer of public resources from government to Crystal Venture, even these loans he spoke about of four million that have built uh, uh, the, the convention center the, that were, government went into, into debt for that money, but suddenly the owners of these hotels is who? Crystal Venture. Mr. Chairman, we have evidence of uh, offshore accounts in Mauritius, which we can always uh, bring to your office. Um, we will ask the State Department if they have any knowledge of any personal corruption um, uh, for President Kagame and, and whether or not he has accumulated uh, wealth uh, that would not be in commensurate with the job of a president. Um, 
Anybody else like to add? I do have to run. We have only a few minutes left. I deeply, we deeply appreciate your testimony, your insights. Uh, it helps enlighten, especially with the new administration. Uh, so thank you so very, very much. Here is adjourned.